The Green Knight is mesmerizing. It is beautifully shot and well-crafted. The scenery is lush, the costumes are colorful and lively, and nearly every scene is a feast for the eyes. But also, the movie is a bit weird, right? And that's not a bad thing. The Green Knight is a fantasy story geared towards adults based on an obscure text about Arthurian morality. A film adaptation was practically destined to be strange. Just look at what we got in the 1980s. But there are good reasons for the weirdness, and it all goes back to the original poem. A critic might say that we shouldn't need to read a book to enjoy a movie, but pick any Shakespearean adaptation ever produced, and it becomes clear that some incredible stories lean on the context of their origins more than others. The Green Knight is one of those stories. So we're going to dig into David Lowry's adaptation and the poem it's based on, and compare the two to figure out what it all means. To start, it helps to have some context about the original tale. Not much is known about the author of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight other than what can be gleaned from the original text, famously translated by J.R.R. Tolkien, among many other writers and historians. Estimates date the poem to sometime around the late 14th century, and the Northwest Midland dialect would place our anonymous author somewhere along the Welsh-English border. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is classified as a chivalric romance, which right away offers some insight into the type of story about to unfold. Chivalric romance is a bit different from what we call romance today. In fact, the term romance originally referred to the language of the narrative, known as Romance Languages. These are languages derived from Latin, such as Italian, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Romanian. Over time, the term came to be applied to certain styles of tales rather than the language itself. In this case, chivalric romance emphasizes themes such as adventure, honor, chivalry, and heroism, with romantic love being only one aspect of the genre. Romances also tend to deal with individuality and issues at an intimate scale, which is a stark contrast from earlier epics, where protagonists and their conflicts are projections of an entire nation. So right away, it becomes clear that this story was never meant to be on the same scale as stories such as Beowulf, the Iliad, or contemporary adventures like Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones. David Lorry's adaptation remains faithful to its source in that regard, rather than evolving into a modern action fantasy adventure. The film actually covers the broad strokes of the original poem rather faithfully, with a few liberties taken in the details, which we'll expand upon later. But for now, we'll go through some of the main changes. First and foremost, Gawain is much different in the film. Generally in Arthurian legend, Gawain is a knight of great courtesy, known for his piousness, compassion, and bravery. But in later stories, as Lancelot became the more popular legend, Gawain's character grew darker, garnering a reputation as a brute and a philanderer. This background makes him one of the more complex knights at the round table, fitting for such a story about Arthurian morality. The poem presents us with a chivalrous version of Gawain, determined to stay the course and be a better man. In the film, Gawain isn't even a knight. He is also significantly less courteous, pious, and honorable than his poem counterpart. However, both versions of Gawain have little experience at this point and are of low ranking compared to the other knights of the round table. We also see early on that Arthur is portrayed as an older king nearing his end. This is in direct opposition to the poem where Arthur is described as youthful, merry, and light-hearted, driven by young blood and a wayward brain. Another key difference in the movie is that Morgan Le Fay is implied to be Gawain's mother when, in Arthurian lore, it is generally understood that Gawain is the son of Morgos, sister to King Arthur and Morgan Le Fay. In a similar vein, Gawain's journey itself is an entirely new addition to the film, as the original text only generalizes his travels up until he reaches the castle. Speaking of which, Gawain's experience at the castle is greatly expanded in the poem. The original story has Gawain resisting the lady's temptations, only relenting a kiss on the first night, two on the second, and three on the third when called out for being discourteous should he refuse. Attempting to uphold his end of the game, he gives the Lord what he has received each day, which are the kisses, in exchange for what the Lord has brought back from his hunt. 
The Lord's hunts are described in considerable detail and placed alongside the Lady's attempted seduction of Sir Gawain, symbolizing the Lady as the huntress and Gawain as the prey. The Lord's final hunt is a fox, symbolizing all the cleverness Gawain will need to evade temptation. But Gawain, like the fox, is finally snared as he accepts the Lady's green girdle and promises to keep it hidden, which contradicts the promise he had already made to the Lord of the Castle. The fox in the film is a nod to this portion of the poem. Lastly, Sir Gawain in the poem does not remove the green girdle, and his ending is far less ambiguous than what we see in the movie. In the poem, the Green Knight brings his axe down and stops when Sir Gawain flinches, mocking him for being a coward. The Green Knight brings his axe down a second time, but stops short. This time, Sir Gawain has not moved. Then the Green Knight brings his axe down a third and final time, but only with enough power to leave a small cut on Sir Gawain's neck, which we'll talk more about later. Now that we know the key differences, we can start to understand how the spirit of the original poem still finds its way into the film. The original text is wrought with symbolism, such as the aforementioned fox, but the most obvious symbol is the color green, likely representing nature. Nature is explored on two fronts. Gawain must overcome the natural elements along his journey, as well as face his natural desires, temptations, and fears. The highly detailed descriptions of armor, instruments, and man-made constructs are juxtaposed against nature, showing that regardless of what man creates, it is of little use against the elements that we are destined to return to. There is also great mention of red and gold, with red representing fiery passion and gold representing prosperity not of riches, but of moral character. But if there is one symbol that stands above all others, it would be the pentangle. The five points of the pentangle represent five characteristics made of five parts each that Gawain will need to uphold to complete his quest. Gawain is to be faultless in his five senses, faultless in his five fingers. He is to contemplate the five wounds of Christ on the cross, but be encouraged by the five joys of the Virgin Mary. And finally, he is to adhere to the five chivalric virtues of knighthood, generosity, chastity, friendship, piety, and courtesy. The number five even makes its way into the poem's structure itself, particularly at the end of each stanza with a series of five rhyming lines referred to as a bob and wheel. Although it is not explicitly stated in the film, if we pay close attention to Gawain's trials, we can see that he is tested on each chivalric virtue throughout his encounters, which we'll come back to later. This brings us to our next point. Why did David Lowry change many details for the movie? The short answer is time. The original poem was written at a time where everyone was familiar with Arthurian tales, so there wasn't a need to establish characters or create a new relatable arc for audiences to be entertained. Think of modern franchises today. Thor isn't rewritten every time he appears in a new Avengers film, is he? Of course not. He picks up right where he left off, which is what our characters do in The Green Knight. Furthermore, the chivalric romance was well understood in the Middle Ages. Characters in a chivalric romance often act as vehicles for an ideology or larger subject, rather than for the sole purpose of character development. This is a bit jarring in the context of modern cinema, where relatable characters are ever important. David Lowry's task became how to stay faithful to the intent of the original poem while making Gawain relatable within the context of a single story. The end result was a reversal of Gawain's character. Instead of watching an honorable man combat his flaws, we watch an already flawed man pursuing honor. But with the change of Gawain came the need to change other aspects of the story, chiefly Gawain's motivations. In the poem, Arthur initially accepts the Green Knight's challenge, but Gawain volunteers out of a sense of duty and honor to his king. This would ring hollow in a film that begins with a deeply flawed version of Gawain. So we introduce the aging King Arthur. Gawain's motivations then become more about glory and proving himself a worthy successor to the king. The decision to change Gawain's mother to Morgan Le Fay essentially follows the same point. In the original story, Morgan Le Fay is behind the entire plot to cause a stir among King Arthur, Guinevere, and the Knights of the Round Table. She is positioned as an enemy. 
However, Morgan Le Fay's position has historically varied between enemy and ally depending on the story. So Lowry takes advantage of this murky history by converting her back to an ally, and her purpose is no longer to scorn Arthur, but to provide her son with a journey to find a sense of honor. Then of course we are left with all the things that happen in between. The relationship with Essel establishes Gawain's conflict between being a good person or trading goodness for glory, a temptation made clear with the Lady of the Castle appearing identical to Essel. The giants, according to an AMA with David Lowry, are another representation of nature's conflict with man. As for the other encounters along Gawain's journey, these all reference the five chivalric virtues mentioned earlier. David Lowry skips exposition about these virtues in favor of allowing the journey to inform a concept of honor by which Gawain is tested. He fails to be generous when he encounters the scavenger, he initially is reluctant to befriend the fox, he nearly fails to be courteous when retrieving Winifred's head, he fails to be chaste in his encounter with the lady of the castle, and he fails to be pious all throughout until he removes the girdle to redeem his flaws. David Lowry sets up each trial as a test of honor, seemingly begging the audience to ask, is the Gawain of the movie worthy of becoming the honorable Sir Gawain of Arthurian lore? So that brings us to Gawain's final encounter with the Green Knight. Remember how in the poem, the Green Knight brings his axe down a third time and only nicks Gawain on the neck? Well, it turns out that the Green Knight is actually the lord of the castle Gawain had been staying at. The first two strikes were pulled because Gawain had been honest the first two nights. The third strike only left a minor cut, as Gawain was honest about the kisses, but failed in keeping the green belt. It's in this scene that the Green Knight is revealed to be more of a mischievous character, not an evil one. The Green Knight is hardly upset. He actually praises Sir Gawain as the most faultless knight to set foot on Earth, and goes on to call him a pearl among peas being prized more highly than all others. Gawain, on the other hand, is ashamed and initially throws the green belt away, only for the green knight to return it to him as a souvenir. Sir Gawain then chooses to wear the green belt like a sash as a reminder of his faults. He returns to Camelot where everyone rejoices while he regales them with his tale. This is a lot different from what is shown in the film. The ending is certainly open to interpretation, but there are a few things to consider that may help us along the way. First off, Lowry has been faithful to the broad strokes and spirit of the original poem, so it would be a drastic departure for Gawain to die when in the poem he lives. Second, upon Gawain throwing the sash to the ground, we see the Green Knight smirk playfully. My brave knight. Now. Off with your head. This is consistent with his mischievous nature revealed in the poem. And lastly, we are treated to a post credit scene showing a young girl in the castle picking up the crown. Arthur didn't have children of his own, so who else's daughter could this be other than that of Sir Gawain? The beauty of the film is that, despite the differences from the poem, it remains true to the original intent. A flawed man can be honorable, or an honorable man can be flawed. The story is a reminder that it is possible to do good without being perfect. Furthermore, the poem is unique for a chivalric romance in that it highlights the fragility of absolute chivalry. In the poem, Gawain would be violating courtesy had he not accepted the lady's demands to hide the green belt, but in doing so, he violated his promise to the lord of the castle. The film takes a different approach by portraying Gawain's struggles with chivalry along his journey. He eventually realizes that, should he take the path of cowardice, he would be committing to a dishonorable life that would bring about nothing but ruin. Up until then, he had been chasing glory for glory's sake. He then removes the belt and lays his soul bare. Through both lenses, we can come to terms with our own flaws and grow comfortable knowing that no one is perfect and everyone is redeemable. But it takes work. Being consistently good can be terribly difficult. But what defines honor is having the courage to be honest with ourselves and march forward in spite of our inherent flaws. I'm ready now. <laughs>